Greetings and welcome to Soka University of America. My name is Nadani Henderson Stull, and I'm an assistant professor of biochemistry, as well as a founding faculty fellow of the Center for Race, Ethnicity, and Human Rights, alongside Dr. Lisa McLeod, assistant professor of international studies, and two remarkable student fellows, Shunji Fweki and Vibhu Walia. The center, led by co-directors, Drs. Kevin Moncrief, Vice President of Mission Integration, and Ian Reed, Director of International Studies, was established to provide space and resources for students and faculty of SUA to engage in inquiry, research, and constructive dialogue related to race, ethnicity, human rights, and their intersections. Our inaugural speaker series, Race and Its Connections, comes at a crossroads in our national discourse on race and the social impact. SUA, found on principles of peace and human rights, embraces the gravity of the moment with a profound sense of responsibility for its global community of students and scholars. The center celebrated its inaugural event last month with a conversation between our distinguished visiting fellow, Dr. Hortense Spillers, Gertrude Conway Vanderbilt Professor of English at Vanderbilt University and Ambassador Andrew Young. Tonight, the center is privileged to welcome Dr. Ruben Jonathan Miller, Assistant Professor at the University of Chicago's Crown Family School of Social Work, Policy and Practice, faculty affiliate at the Center for St the Study of Race, Politics and Culture and Department of Sociology. This is where he studies and writes about race, democracy and the social life of the city. He has been a member at the Institute for the Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey, a fellow at the New America Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation, and a visiting scholar at the University of Texas at Austin and Dartmouth College. A native son of Chicago, he lives with his wife and children on the city's south side. I also welcome Ms. Jody Polk. Jody Polk is the lead organiz organizer and founder of the Legal Empowerment and Advocacy Hub, LEA, the first participatory defense hub in Florida. LEA is a community organizing model designed to combat mass incarceration, humanize defendants, impact the outcome of cases and transform the landscape of power in the court system. A formerly incarcerated law clerk, Polk received a Soros Justice Advocacy Fellowship in 2018 when she founded the Jailhouse Lawyers Initiative, JLI, a network dedicated to the legal empowerment of jailhouse lawyers and enhancing the law clerk training program and law libraries and prisons throughout the United States. Polk is also the current director of the Alchua County Reentry Coalition, the executive director and founder of the Florida Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls, and the director of community justice at the River Phoenix Center for Peacebuilding. She served as the Central Florida organizer on the successful campaign to restore voting rights to over 1.5 million Florida residents with fel felony convictions. She is a dedicated member of the National Council for Inc Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls, the League of Women Voters, the National Lawyers Guild, and Fight Toxic Prisons. These two esteemed guests join SUA's virtual campus tonight to discuss Professor Miller's acclaimed book, Halfway Home, Race, Punishment, and the Afterlife of Mass Incarceration. Both tender and unsentimental, granular in particulars, and exhaustive in its empiricism, Halfway Home examines the narrative of criminal rehabilitation against the realities of life after incarceration in America. Through countless hours of conversation with prisoners, former prisoners, their friends, and their families, Dr. Miller re reveals a carceral system that extends far beyond prison walls and even sentences served into a serial of into, excuse me into a series of social, economic, legal, and material bounds that comprise a second order of punishment for ex-prisoners. Bringing to bear the gift of proximity, including his past experience as a prison chaplain and the son and brother of men who have been incarcerated, Dr. Miller commutes the sensations of the body 
to the body of scholarship on post-incarceration as few writers could. Given his book's many recent accolades, the media spotlight and inevitable requests for, for your presence, we again are grateful that both you and Jody have accepted the invitation to be with us today. Welcome to Soka, welcome. Thank you, thank you so much, Professor Henderson, uh, for, for the lovely welcome. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm blushing and embarrassed and appreciative um, and, and grateful, grateful for you um, and have known you now for years and know that you are just a rock star. I feel like um, Soka is quite privileged to have you and the students, the students benefit, I'm sure, um, from, from time with you. So thank you, thank you so much uh, for this lovely invitation and also to Professor Reed and, and the professors affiliated with this uh, lovely new center on race and human rights. It's fantastic uh, that, uh, to, to, to hear and know about what you're doing. And also thank you to my dear sister, Jody Polk, who's with us today. Uh, I'm excited uh, about, about what she's going to bring uh, uh, in, in this conversation. So I'd like to begin with a reading uh, from, from the book and the reading will come from the fourth chapter, a chapter uh, called Millions of Details. And just to tell you just a, a tiny bit about what the book is about, the book is about uh, how mass incarceration is experienced uh, by its targets, by prisoners, by their family, by their friends, uh, by people that we've left out of the social contract, uh, by the most vulnerable among us, in fact, the least of these uh, among us, according to uh, a, a few holy scriptures, but I'll, I'll begin this reading. Hello, this is a collect call from some voice that sounded like my brother's, a prisoner at the Michigan Department of Corrections if you feel you are being victimized or extorted by this prisoner, call customer service at some number rattled off too quickly for me to catch. The digital woman gave more instructions. To accept this call, press zero. To refuse it, press one. To prevent calls from this facility, press six. Why was Jeremiah calling collect? I'd added money to his account, or at least that's what I thought. Shit, I hissed out loud, but not quite loud enough for my son, to J Jonathan, to notice. I fumbled through papers and moved books to find my wallet under a coffee mug. In Michigan, people in prisons may call using prepaid, phone car, uh, prepaid accounts. Calls cost 21 cents per minute plus a $2.95 processing fee. I spent $80 per month on my brother's calls. Why was he calling collect? Did he forget his passcode? Had I paid JPay again instead of Connect Network, which also handled inmate trust funds for your loved one to buy soap and ramen noodles? We still use JPay to send emails. They were the cheaper option. For 20 cents a page and 20 cents an image, you could send a five page letter. Add a dollar for a holiday e-greeting card. An email could cost $3. Return stamps cost an additional 25 cents per page. Jeremiah sent updates and asked about my family. At the end of each note, he'd make his requests. He'd ask me to look up job training programs or to send screenshots from his Facebook page. He'd ask for books and magazine subscriptions. He'd always need money for something. Gym shoes, a television set, an AM, FM radio, each item costing twice as much from the commissary as it costs in the free world. I sent Jeremiah $250 for his first Christmas inside to buy boots and a television set. We didn't know then that the MDOC takes half of everything over $50 in a 30 day period to cover legal debts. And Jeremiah, like every other prisoner in the United States, owed thousands of dollars. $600 for the checked out public defender who met with him just once for 20 minutes on the day of his plea deal. $1,611 for court costs, $400 for an extradition fee, and $68 for the state minimum cost to record his felony record. The cash that remained from his Christmas gift left enough to buy boots or a TV, but not both. I was breathing hard now, my chest tightening. I couldn't remember if you pressed hashtag after your debit card number or if you waited to enter your security code. Shit, I thought. The digital lady was making me start over again. What must it have been like for Jeremiah standing at the phone on his unit? Was there silence? Did he hear me entering digits? After spending too long in my head, the call connected. What's up, Ruby Scuber? What you doing? Jeremiah asked. We caught up like we always did. 
quickly. He told me a funny story about the men he lived with and asked about my wife and kids. Let me ask you this though, he said, as he always did before making his requests. I was always relieved to hear his voice, but I was always in the middle of something. That time I was writing this book, something I hadn't done before. The previous time I was in a faculty meeting. The time before that I was on a date. No matter if I was sleeping or playing with my kids or trying to clear my mind, when the call came, I had to answer. Any boxer will tell you that the punch you don't see coming is the one that puts you down. The collect calls you didn't expect, the court date you didn't have the gas money to attend, the conversations with your children about why their uncle was in prison and when he was coming home, the honest answer to the second question, you're not sure. The $2.95 processing fee that overdrew your account, the six thirty-four dollars overdraft fees, the unexpected embarrassment as you sit at your desk entering an order for 30 packages of ramen noodles, what it feels like when Michigan packages runs out of the flavor of noodles he wanted. It's these little things, the daily disruptions that manage to put you down. A million families live this way, sending money they can't afford, making court dates they don't have time for, driving five hours only to be turned around because the facility is on lockdown or because someone's dress isn't quite long enough. It's the way the guard talks to you when you visit and how you're herded single file through dingy corridors just to pay too much for microwave concessions. It's watching your loved ones demolish that food and how they're marched away when the visit ends. It's feeling alone, though everyone you know has experienced this. One in two Americans have lived some version of the story because a full half of all US adults and nearly two thirds of all black people in this country have a loved one who's done time. However, it's not just the family members who are frustrated. It's especially hard for people in prison. The combination of bad cell phone reception and a busy life means your incarcerated loved one can't reach you. After four attempts, he wonders if your distance is intentional. It's your tone when you finally accept the charge from frustrations they couldn't have caused. He's gone weeks without mail and months without a visit He's hearing another lecture from his younger sibling, his little brother, about what he should be doing with his life. He's trying to raise his children through collect calls 15 minutes at a time. He knows what he put you through, but he calls you anyway because he needs you. Prison exacerbates these needs and it escalates these tensions, changing the nature of even the most intimate relationships. But it's not just like this on the inside. The prison is like a ghost, haunting formerly incarcerated people as they look for work or place to stay or as they sit for dinners with the people they love most. Upon release, people with criminal records are greeted by over 45,000 policies that dictate where they may go, with whom they may live, and how they spend their time. These collateral consequences prevent them from fully participating in the labor and housing market. Today, there are 19,219 employment restrictions that keep people with criminal records out of the workplace. 1,033 housing restrictions keep them from being able to rent an apartment. 3,954 restrictions limit their civic participation and 1,612 constrain their family and domestic rights. This means they may not hold most public offices. They may not sit on juries in most states. There are hundreds of categories of employment for which someone with a record need not apply. They may not rent an apartment and will struggle to find a place to stay. In some states, they may not vote. But if all politics are local, the politics of mass incarceration are hyper-local. Just pick a state. New York has 1,052 laws and policies that lock people with criminal records out of the economy. Michigan has 659. Illinois has 1,289, including 512 that target employment alone, 177 that target political and civic regulations, preventing people with criminal records from changing the laws and policies and hem them in, 30 housing restrictions, and there are 50 policies that regulate family life. There's so few places 
where formerly incarcerated people can turn to in their times of need. This is due to changes in liability law, which began in the 1970s and 1980s. Tenants sued negligent landlords when they were robbed and mugged in their buildings. The court sided with the tenants, finding that crime prevention was a part of every landlord's responsibility. Landlords were fined under nuisance ordinances for letting their buildings fall into disrepair, for harboring drug users and gang activity, and for leasing apartments to people with criminal records. In 1996, Congress passed the Housing Opportunity Extension Act, requiring public housing agencies across the country to evict tenants for, quote, any criminal activity, including crimes committed on or off such premises or by any member of the tenant's household, any guest or other person under the tenant's control. Almost overnight, private citizens were conscripted into the nation's crime-fighting machinery. Offering help to someone with a criminal record could now cost you your livelihood. Mothers were being evicted for the crime of letting their children who had been to prison sleep on their couch. Cousins, lovers, and friends who let people with records visit their home, they were evicted too. I knew that this was the world that my brother would enter, where the laws that prevent him from getting a job or renting an apartment also made it risky for people to offer him help. And I knew that the support he needed in prison would pale in comparison to what he would need when he returned. My brother, like the 19.6 million people estimated to have a felony record in this country, would enter an economy of favors, where he would be tasked with soliciting support from people who were encouraged not to help him meet his basic needs. You have one minute remaining, the voice said. I jotted down Jeremiah's requests. I love you, bro, my brother said. I appreciate all you do. I love you too, man, I replied before the digital woman disconnected the line. That was an excerpt from the chapter, Millions of Details. Um, at this time, I'd love to invite uh, my sister, Jody Polk, uh, to respond maybe to what she heard or even to things that we've discussed in the past about uh, what life looks like uh, after a conviction. Yes, thank you so much, um, Ruben, and as well as all of the staff at Sokol University and everyone. Um, it's always a pleasure to be heard, um, to be seen, because we truly are isolated. And, you know, it amazes me to honestly be here because I had so many conversations with Ruben, um, you know, after we met and leading up to him writing the book. And for me, it has honestly been my life. It hasn't been the work. And so trying to fit in between the reality of, you know, what was going on in community, my experience of getting free while incarcerated and then coming home and then not even having a place to practice, you know, the human being that I had so become inside of incarceration. And so, just really want to say um, how much I appreciate because we talk about narratives and we hear narratives and recognizing when I went when I went to prison, I recognized that the narrative that I was telling myself over and over again was not my narrative. You know, even I remember um, reading statistics at the time. My I was incarcerated. My children's father were incarcerated. Both my brothers were incarcerated, and my mom. And so statistics said that my children, it was 70% higher chance of them being incarcerated and holding on to that and coming home and not finding a place to practice. It wasn't until I began working on the campaign to restore voting rights, which I, I can't take any credit um, for that. It was such a people's um, approach to saying, no, we're not gonna take this anymore and to actually see community members joining in and to even see statistics that I hadn't seen before, that majority of the people who were actually um, disenfranchised were not even black people, they were white people. And so it has been a process and it truly is still a process that I'm going through every day, not to just remember what happened in prison, but to actually live in a way that upsets those narratives in the community 
Mm. At the Legal Empowerment and Advocacy Hub, we talk about the cycle of incarceration. And most times when we think about mass incarceration, it's easy to think about police and we think about the jail, we think about the prison, but I grew up in neighborhoods where it was honestly comparable to prison. I was so shocked to get to prison and recognize how much the prison was set up just like the neighborhood. I'll never forget being home in about two years after my release, reading a story about the violence that was happening against women in Lowell um, Correctional Facility, which is in Florida where I live. And for the first time, recognizing that it was wrong. But I had experienced violence. I had experienced, you know, um, just all of the, the words um, that we use to marginalize people. But I didn't even know I was marginalized. It was honestly not until working on a campaign to restore voting rights that I learned about the 13th Amendment, that I actually had the opportunity to understand how local government worked and how that impacted my life on a day-to-day -day basis. And so some of the things that really came up to me um, while Ruben was reading the story, which is not so much a story, it was a life. And I have to say, I appreciate you for being real and telling your story. I can't help but notice how different my own story is. You know, for me, it was safe to be isolated and to forget my family on the inside. There was no phone calls. Um, there was no, hardly any visits. And to, we hear this, the saying, out of sight, out of mind. It truly is out of sight, out of mind. And to be in that place and to find peace and to find love inside of myself. And Ruben said it beautifully, there is no regimen to keep you going. However, I was fortunate enough to, while working in the law library, hearing the countless stories of women and recognizing how we all had the same story and then coming up with creative solutions to use the same laws that were used against us to prosecute us, to actually liberate us. And to see women, including myself, liberated in ways that didn't include us walking out of the institution. And so that has been the foundation of anything that I have been able to achieve. Um, honestly, the Jailhouse Lawyers Initiative is an opportunity for the work that I was able to be a part of to actually reach back into community. Because a lot of times when we talk about abolition and we talk about reentry and we talk about um, the prison experience, for a lot of people, it's the norm. Mm -hmm. It's so normal. We don't even know, you know, that this is wrong. We don't even know um, about collateral consequences because honestly, those collateral consequences existed for me and my family before we were incarcerated. Mm -hmm. This is interesting, Jody. I, I want to um, bring us back to something that you said. Uh, you, you, so, so, so many powerful things that you raised, um, and I want to come back. I want to, I want to bring us to an earlier point, and then I want to, I want to come back to this, the issue of community. Uh, but just for a hot second, you know, you talked about not being able to practice when you get home, and so I want to, I want to, I'd love to ask you a question. Not, on, not about community on the outside. I'd love to ask you a question about community on the inside. So, 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 but, but, but with, with a segue, like with, with, with a caveat rather. So, so there's something really interesting about women's incarceration in our country, the things that we know. We know that we criminalize survivors of, 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 of harm. Uh, so we know that over 80% of women uh, who are incarcerated in the United States have experienced some form of sexual trauma, some form of sexual abuse. That's what the statistics say. And we know that over half of the prisoners in this country have a, have a, have a diagnosable um, uh, mental, mental health condition with something like 15% of all prisoners, which is far greater than it is in the general population, having being diagnosed with a quote, serious mental illness, you know, something on, 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 along the lines of schizophrenia, you know, deep bipolar disorder, you know, these kinds of things where, 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 where mental health conditions are, 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 are more so prevalent. And we know that we arrest, we arrest, we take off the street groups of people that we consider problems uh, in this country. And so 
we know that we kind of know that we do that. And then we have these presumptions about what happens when you get on the inside. We think everybody's broken, everybody's lost, everybody's dead on the inside, everybody's violent, everybody's a problem. But that wasn't your experience. You got inside and you found something like community. And I'd love for you to talk about that because it, it helps us understand um, uh, how deeply human uh, everyone who we lock up and, and, and everyone, by the way, but, but, but certainly everyone who we lock up uh, in this country are. And I will be honest with you, when I went stay handed down the eight year sentence, in my mind, I already saw what was coming. I knew that this would be an opportunity for me to just give over, you know, to mm -hmm. the environment, to the narrative that was growing around who I could be as a black woman. So I was excited to go to prison to hook up with what I thought were going to be drug dealers, the tough of the tough and be able to come home and finally, you know, live out this dream of, you know, terror and violence and the narrative that shaped our neighborhoods. However, when I got there, I found poets. I found writers. I found grandmothers, mothers. It was the first time I honestly had positive relationships with women. I, being a law clerk, I also had the opportunity to um, to serve women that were on death row and women that were in confinement, isolated, solitary confinement. And you'd be surprised at how those women mentored me. And so definitely the peace and the love and the joy that I, I have, um, it comes from that practice of women coming together and being able to be there for one another in a yeah. way that couldn't support, you know? Absolutely. Jody, you know, it, it, it speaks to something powerful. It speaks to the potential that we keep locking up to me. You know, it, it, it says something about, you know, so, so now to come back to your earlier comment before we invite uh, Professor Henderson in, because uh, Professor Henderson will have some questions for us. And also, I should say um, to, the, to the folks listening that if you have questions, you know, please uh, put them in the, in the Q&A. Um, but I want to now switch, pivot out to community. Um, and, 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 and Professor Henderson, I have two questions for Jody before we, before we, <laughs> before, before we do a, a group conversation. But, but the, 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 fir the first thing, Jody, I'd, I'd love for you to talk to us about, and of course, I'm happy to talk about the book too. So, so <laughs> there's plenty to talk about. But, but Jody, the, the first thing I'd like for you to talk to us about um, it, are, is, is the deep potential, the, 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 reservoir, the reservoir of skills and, 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 and strengths that, that you found um, uh, in these women on, on the inside and what we do, what we do, how we respond uh, to that, to those strengths, uh, to, 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 to these women on the outside. It is, excuse me y'all, it's really been um, a long, long week uh, thus far. However, when I think of about a safe community, that is why I do the work that I do to bring that community outside. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't get, we don't have the opportunity to go back in and work with our kids. We don't have the opportunity to even volunteer at our kids' school or to go on a field trip with your kids mm -hmm. to get a job and to have, I worked as a law clerk and had amazing skills. And once I couldn't find that job or get a job doing those, you know, things, I had to go and work into a hotel which I was able to, you know, translate that into greater skills. But so many women give up when you're knocking on the door, when you come home excited to add value back in your community, and then you actually can't do that. It really sends a message loud and clear. And for me, I remember coming home and I had achieved college. I was married in the first year. I had a job within 30 days. I was truly dedicated to beating the statistics. I just would not believe that I was who they said I was. And to find myself still wanting to go back to prison. And because it wasn't that it was better, it was, it was actually easier, you know, to be incarcerated. And so definitely we hurt people when we do all that self-work. And we come home healed, mm -hmm. redeemed, mm -hmm. survivors, and haven't been able to, you know, deal with those pains and those hurts and want to actually give back and live from a place of true freedom. And you can't do that. I mean, it really mm -hmm. sends folks back. 
you know, and despite this, you know, just to talk about um, Jody, you know, Jody's not a spotlight type of person. So, you know, for, so, so Jody's has got to forgive me while I brag about her many, uh, the, 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 just the many things she's, she's, she's managed to accomplish. Um, one of the things that, that, that we're, we're now talking about are the many barriers that people face when they come home, you know, and so, and so, and so they, they, you know, you send somebody to prison because they, they, they cause some sort of harm and they go off and do this incredible work despite despite the conditions you set up in the prison. So, so you set the prison up in such a way that people don't have the things that they need, that it's terribly expensive to reach people inside. So, so, so those visits start diminishing right away. Uh, that, 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 that's, that's nearly impossible to maintain a relationship with people who are very close to them. But somehow, you know, folks like Jody, uh, 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 folks who, who've gone down, manage to maintain connection. And then they come home and we don't reward their hard work. You know, come home with a bunch of skills, put yourself through school, you know, learn a job, acquire a thing and get met by 19,000 laws and policies to tell you which jobs you can't have. You know, uh, my guys would, would become barbers and cosmetologists. And it wasn't until 2018 in the state of Illinois that they could use their barber or cosmetology license because there was a law that, that pre prevented them from being able to be barbers and cosmetologists. You couldn't groom a dog in Illinois if you had a, a felony record. In many states, you can't sit on juries. So now someone who's in a situation that you understand oh so well because you stood in front of that judge, you know what they're going through and you can tell when a guy or a woman has changed their life and they are never gonna do this again. You know, because you've been around them. You might be the person that keeps them from getting sentenced for 20, 30 years and you can't even sit on the jury. Okay, so that's all the bad stuff. That's all the terrible stuff, the depressing stuff. The book's a little bit depressing. <laughs> you know, like, that's, all, that's all the depressing stuff. But then people like Jody, you know, and just, 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 just allow me to brag on you for a hot second. Not only, you know, steps out of, of, of all of that and gets right in the mix of restoring the rights of 1.5 million people. That's its own thing, <laughs> you know, but forms an organization that, that says, you know what, democracy isn't working. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start a participatory defense hub. We're going to pool people power to make sure this unjust system works in our favor. And then, and then pulls off some court victories, which we don't even have to talk about, you know, <laughs> but, but, then, but then pulls off some amazing court victories, you know? Um, and so, and so, and so, and so when, when I, when I hear, when I hear from uh, folks uh, like Jody, I, I, I hear, I hear, I, I'm, I'm always, I'm always hopeful. You know, and I'm, I'm, I'm just grateful. I'm, I'm, I'm just grateful to know you. And I'm grateful to be um, on this journey with you. Uh, so anyway, Professor Henderson, maybe, maybe, I can, maybe we can invite Professor Henderson into the conversation. Um, and, 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 and I'd love to, I'd love to, 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 to take questions or to um, think through uh, things that we, we found in the book or, or whatever's of interest. Well, I think my first question is for Jody, and I'll come back to you, Professor Miller. Um, I heard you speak somewhere else, and um, I love the story that you talked about that showed your resolve that you wanted to be a lawyer, and everyone told you you couldn't be a lawyer because you were incarcerated. And for us, this is a primarily undergraduate institution, we have lots of students and a lot of our students are international and many of my students wanna go on to medical school and they're hearing rules about, you can't go to medical school if you're an international student because the US medical schools take domestic students. But I think even though this story is very different, the story of how you reached out for mentorship how you found someone. Could you share that with our students? Because I just think it's a really powerful story of resolve. Yes, and this is what kept me alive. With all the things that Ruben you know, named and all of the, I've been able to accomplish a lot in the last past four years, but it all started from one vision and that was to go to law school. I loved being a jailhouse lawyer because I could translate the law and recognize that I had a skill. So I knew that I was a lawyer. And even though I let them tell me where I could live when I got out, I accepted you know, that I couldn't volunteer at my kid's school. I accepted that I was gonna go to work at you know, this hotel and I did it with integrity. But when they told me 
that I would not be able to attend law school at the University of Florida. I was absolutely not. I could not for nothing believe that what I had known about myself and who those women reflected to me, who I was, that I could not be that. And so I searched um, for at least just one person in Florida that had actually gotten the bar. And she is now a dear friend of mine. I met a woman named Veronica Olympia. I emailed her every day until she emailed me back. Her story was similar to mine. She wasn't in her 70s and 80s, but she had you know, um, gone through the system and she become a lawyer and she told me, yes, you can be a lawyer and I needed that permission. And she introduced me to Desmond Mead. And so that who's the founder of Amendment 4, restore, um, restoring the, vote, the voter rights to for Floridians. And so it truly has been a self empowered journey that has rippled effect out into ways that I could not believe. And so I have to honestly tell you, don't take that no. If someone's telling you you can't, that's honestly a sign that you have to and that you should. And I'm, I'm telling everybody, we're not even expecting to see anything that we've seen before. We should be seeing things different. So keep knocking, keep kicking, because relationships are important. And it's going to take all of us standing up, no matter what, where we're at, but standing up to injustice, because it happens to people so often everywhere you are and then the one time when you know you commit a crime or you do something or you're accused of doing something the consequences are unforgivable Ruben I have a question for you so one of the things that um, I really admired in reading the book is not just how open and vulnerable you are at storytelling, but the actual breadth of the topics in the book. You start the book with an account of the first um, Black prisoner in 1799, and you bring the book to today. Your experience as a chaplain, I think, helps um, undergirds the parallels that you make between um, confession in religion and then confession um, when you make a plea deal. And so when I say that I think that you wrote this book in a way that no one else could have, I, I say that sincerely because I think your lived experience um, really um, sh is shaped in the words and the text of the book. Um, you're also a, a tenure track professor. Mm -hmm. And it's my understanding that um, books are required <laughs> for getting tenure. But you sort of push academic precedents to the side in your writing of the book. You didn't publish with an academic press. You don't have policy subscriptions at the end of the text. You include yourself as a subject in your own work, which I understand not being a sociologist is taboo. Um, clearly your work is getting Alkalades, the New York Times wrote extremely positive things about your book, NPR. I keep hearing your name all over. And so it's working for you. But I wonder, even when I talked to you early on and you told me you were making a decision not to go with an academic press, I sort of wonder what, um, so many times there's, there's so much about being your authentic self when you're thinking about yourself on the tenure track. How did you navigate just being you and doing what you thought you needed to do to tell the story of your scholarship, of the people whose lives you met and were impacted by? Mm -hmm. I appreciate this question very much. I mean, they're, they're um, well, so, so on some level, I think 
Okay, so so th 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 there are a couple things th there are a couple things here that, that, that I'd like to to speak to. So the reason why you read a, you read history, and so that that was the the founder of Chicago, um, Jean Baptiste Pointe du Sable was was the black immigrant founder, the Haitian immigrant founder of Chicago, um, and 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 the reason why his story was important, and, and this will this will this will uh, I'm gonna walk into this point about like what I hope is authenticity, um, and 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 a point about allowing yourself to be vulnerable and close um, uh, to, 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 to others. Um, so, so, the re so, so you can't understand mass incarceration in Chicago if you don't know that the city was founded by a black guy who didn't get his props until, you know, I don't know, 20 years ago. And that, and that you know, founded by a black man and, 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 and was not really in the history books in any substantial way until like the 1970s and 1980s in this city, and and you know with, with you know the third you know this is, we're, Chicago's an important city in this country, um, and and you can't so you, unless you know something about racial disdain and and and, and segregation and, and how that works, but also unless you know something about mass incarceration, you can't know anything about mass incarceration in, in Chicago if you don't know that, and I and I don't mean this literally, but I, but I do, <laughs> you unless, if you don't know that. Uh, Jean Baptiste Point du Sable, the black immigrant founder, was arrested under suspicion of, of, of being a British sympathizer. And you can't know that much about mass incarceration in this city with its machine politics and strangeness um, if you don't know that the first psychologist to work as a warden in a, in a, in a, in a department of corrections was a black man. For, uh, who lived in this city, who was also arrested. <laughs> so, <laughs> and you can't understand the Cook County Jail, which was the third largest jail in the country when I was doing my work in there and is the largest integrated court system in the country, if unless you understand it as a set of expansion projects. I, in my mind, this is the best way to understand it. So, so what am I getting at here? History is alive and well. When you go into a courtroom, you're not just sitting in front of this one judge who happens to be a white man who happens to know nothing about you. You're sitting here with the history of white supremacy. You're, you're, you're looking at it embodied right back at you. And, 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 and you're experiencing that as a person in a court with a history in a community with a history, wrestling with history. Yeah, you know, when Jody's fighting the court system, Jody is fighting history. And that can feel like an uphill battle if you don't know anything about black struggle in this country. <laughs> if you don't know about the history of the ancestors who fought on slave ships in ports and in seas in the barracoon, which is the jail cell, the place where they kept slaves is called the barracoon, which is a jail cell. Black folks revolted at every moment in history, at every moment of capture. And so when I see Jody, I see every moment of history that she brings to bear with her, in, which is why she gets a free of a, 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 a not guilty verdict last week <laughs> for, for, for a case she's advocating for that looked impossible, uphill, bananas crazy, because she brings the history of the ancestors with her into that moment. This ain't magic, this is history, right? And so, and so, and so it's okay, so, so I got a question I need to answer. And, and I need to do everything I can to answer that question. I need to answer that question as best I can. So if I'm gonna understand what mass incarceration looks like in the place in which I work, I need to know something about that place. So that's why history is there. And religion is there because religion uh, infiltrates criminal justice policy and practice in this country. Notions of guilt and innocence pervade it, pervade it. Notions of separation from sin, separation from the flesh, pervade it. Fear pervades how we think about the other. And it's not just in criminal justice. And so the reason why the book feels expansive is because the problem is expansive. It's, 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 not, just, it's not just a question of criminality, crime or not. Did the person commit a crime or not? It's how do I think about this person from cradle to grave? And how do I respond to their needs when I see them? A child cries out in school and I say, you're gonna be suspended if I view that person in a particular kind of way based on this longstanding history of white supremacy, of, of, of disdain for the poor um, in this country that's brought to bear on the marginalized among us. You see what I'm saying? So like, like there's, there's, so there's, there, there, there are questions that I must answer and to answer those questions, I gotta go to history and philosophy and, 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 you know, and, and, I, and I gotta go to psychology to understand how and why you think my children are older than yours. 
you know, Philip Ativa Golf says that 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 uh, juror, that, that 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 people when polled think black children are four years older than white children. This is why when Tamir Rice was shot dead in the street, the police officers, the police union talked about Tamir Rice as the male, not as the twelve-year-old. It's why the question that the jury thought was reasonable was, does the officer fear for their life? And my job as a scholar is to say, is that a reasonable question? Are we even asking the right question? We haven't even yet asked the right question. My job is to get us to the right question. This is before I start giving out a bunch of answers and responses and solutions. That's why there's no policy chapter. We haven't yet grasped the problem. So I can't give you a policy chapter. You, you know, you can't, you, no, you can't have a five point plan for me, you know, to, to, <laughs> to, right, right, to unravel this, this world that we've made because we hate the poor, we hate the other, we eat our own. And we're so racist. This, this is this is the racism in the country. So I'm just this, this you know this is the race and human rights center. I'm just being honest. You know this country is so racist that this point that Jody raised goes right over our head. This point that Jody raised is about getting to prison and seeing a bunch of white people goes right over our head. We got a million white folks in jails and prisons in this country, but the country is so racist that it thinks jails and prisons are for black people. So, 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 I, so I got, I got, I got to, I got to deal with this. And this is not, this is not a problem that comes in a neat package or a neat silo. It's a problem that's expansive, and 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 and, and, and that shows up and and it shows up all over the place, which tells me that the tools of my science are inadequate to answer the question in the ways that I've approached it before. So I must approach this in a different way. I must start from a place of honesty. I'm not dealing with a judge. I'm dealing with history. I'm not dealing with a criminal, I'm dealing with a person who behaves in a particular kind of way, who I've constructed in a particular, who I've categorized in a certain way. And that those categories come from this longer history of disdain for these groups. And this is, this is motivated by a set of material interests, of course, uh, but not just material interests, also fear, fear of the other and the need to get distant, to cut them off from the social body, to amputate them from the social body and put them away five, six, seven, eight, ten 10 hours away from their mother. So she cannot visit her child, you know? I gotta wrestle with this history of cruelty that I've, that I've, that I've embraced as normal. And the tools of my scientific practice uh, have not been adequate because I've pretended as if it's not people that I'm throwing in a cage. I pretend as if they're things I've thrown in a cage and I studied them like things from a distance. So I say, no, let's get close. What happens when you get close? What happens when you allow yourself close? Right up next to the person who's, who's going through this thing. And you might not experience anything like they've ever experienced, right? But, 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 but you felt your own pain and you know your own pain. What happens if I get in touch with my own pain and I write and I, and I walk alongside my brother, my sister? What if I take them actually as my brother or sister? What if I treat them as such analytically? Then I said, oh snap, I'm doing all this close work and I'm not including myself. <laughs> you know, right? like, you know, like, okay, if, if, if I'm right, if, 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 I'm, if, if I'm if I'm right about this, if I'm not just lying to myself, if I'm if I'm right or to others, if I'm if I'm right about this, then I should be in this model. I was born poor and black after 1972 when mass incarceration begins in earnest. When we incarcerate more people every year. Every straight year, the rate and number of people that we incarcerate increases from 1972 to 2009. The largest experiment in incarceration in the history of the modern world. Where we arrest more of our citizens than any other nation by a long shot. More than the gulags in Russia. You have a question? Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, this, so anyway, long, long story short, and to wrap, <laughs> I got I, so so I'm I'm doing I'm doing what I do because I have a question I need to answer, and I'm doing my best to answer that question. But also, there's value. There's value. I get to see things I wouldn't ordinarily see by taking this method. Um, and I think that's why people appreciate it. And I think my commitment to being close. I hope. It's, 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 it's what the people who I spend time with, who are all like family, by the way, um, see in me. And I, and I have to speak to that because that, and Ruben, you've modeled that so much to me. And sometimes we don't think, we don't know these statistics. You know, I've gone to the Legacy Museum, to the EJI, the Equal Justice Initiative in Alabama four times now. 
did not know the history. And so when being close and being in a relationship, it also gave me the opportunity to admit that there was things that I did not know. You know, we're so primed to have to show up and fit into something that is never created for you in the first place. And to come to that realization, like I'm just now, honestly, sometimes recognizing that race is real, you know, and that racism is real and that these institutions and systems aren't just systems, but they're people. And mm -hmm. you know that we have like rights. And so that closeness, you know, at Leah, we say humanity, you can't teach it. You can't teach citizenship, it's inspired. So thank you, Ruben, because you truly inspire and continue to inspire um, for all of us to share, you know, our experiences in a way that we can see the, the total diversity. So um, we have a few people who have their hands up and I'm gonna ask those people to put their um, questions in the chat and I'll read them out to our speakers. But we have one question already in the Q, sorry, not in the chat, in the Q and A. Um, one question in the Q and A um, from an anonymous attendee, the problem that the former prison, prisoners, prisoners face is enormous. How does American society begin the process of acknowledging and working to remedy this injustice? especially when many Americans do not have firsthand experience with the criminal justice system. Let, let, let me take the first brief slice at this. I know Jody has a bunch of, um, has, has, has something to say about this. Uh, so I, I, I suggest two things. So, so, so um, um, one, I think that um, if we pay attention, we'll see that all of us are affected by it. You know, half of Americans have a, have a loved one who's been to jail or prison. And that doesn't mean that these are things that we talk about every day because they're not the things we taught ourselves to hide. There's another reason why I try to be vulnerable and, and talk about my brother, my father, you know, my experiences coming up as, a, as somebody was poor and black and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I remember when I was on the job market years ago, the first time, um, you know, I had a, some job interviews and I will tell you that five deans of, of prominent institutions came to me, pulled me to the side and said, hey man, my son, my daughter, you know, I've had this experience. We've chased them back and forth out of jail. I'm tired. I'm, thank you for your work or something like that. But let me, let, me just, let me just vent with you for a hot second and just talk to you about what I'm feeling right now. You know, so, that, that's, that's, so one thing is we're closer than we think we are if we allow ourselves to be, that's part one. And then um, the second thing is I think we start from, a, I wanna go abstract and then Jody, Jody's gonna have some, 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 some of our own ideas, of course, but let me, go, let me go abstract for a hot second. I think that we have to um, make an ethical commitment to creating a society in which uh, people who have harmed us have a place. I think we can't run from the tough stuff. The tough stuff is what do you do with somebody who caused me harm, somebody who did violence to me, somebody I care about, et cetera. And, and the question is, what kind of world would I make? And so, and so, and so I think that, 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 that we have to figure out a way to live together. And, and I think that's the place you start from. And to get there, I think you start with a politics of hospitality. Um, and, and so this is something that I come to in the book that, that um, you know, I hope people decide to pick up, uh, but even if you don't, the idea that, um, you know, uh, that, 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 that child or that man or that woman deserves a place in the world just because they're human, not because of things that they did right or wrong. And it's from that place that I begin to design my society. If this is the case, what do I need for them to thrive and for me to thrive? I have to get rid of my fear-based social policy and my emphasis on safety and think about questions of thriving. What do I need to thrive? And what do I need for them to thrive? How do we thrive together? Given this person even may have a problem. Uh, this, is, this, this comes from a commitment. It, it doesn't come from a good feeling. Yes, it, it really took it straight out of my mouth. Uh, we have to start by treating people like human beings. You know, I have, treat me like a mom, treat me like a sister, treat me like, you know, a, a student, treat me like a normal community member. And once we get those narratives out of our mind and we have to talk about it and to talk about it with people, that's why I'm so open to have conversations and to be able to share because not only am I, you know, healing by telling the truth of my own story, but we get to embrace people's you know situations because at the core although we've had different experiences like Ruben said we can we know what it feels like to have fear we know what it feels like to have loss and so when we stop judging 
so much of the action, but get to know people, ask questions. Um, we really do get to see an opportunity to reimagine and to honestly, anything, I would question anything. And that's something I have to do now because white supremacy, someone told me recently, is not just someone calling, you know, someone an N word or just physically attacking somebody, it's actually written in our laws and our history. And so we have to be able to see it and know it. And the only way we can know it is we got to get up close to it. So totally agree, but treat, treat former prisoners like human beings and take empathy and not just see them as, you know, trauma or a person, you know, with um, pain or even sometimes when we call it marginalized and poor, you know, actually meet people where they're at and do that in a way that humanizes people to be honest and to be themselves. So then we can ask for help when we need it. So I have a question, but I'm gonna put my question on hold because there's another question from a student. And um, I wasn't sure if I could read the person's name, so I'll read it without their, their attribution, but it says, Hi there, it is so refreshing how authentic this conversation is. Thank you for this. As a black person and a big sister to a formerly incarcerated person, I get it. What would you say to current black students on campus who don't know how to be vulnerable, how to tell our own stories, especially when our narratives have been minimized and are so alien on a campus that's international among students and faculty? Well, that's such a that's such a great question, and uh, and it's a, it, in some ways it's a it's a, I mean not in some ways it's a, it's a tough situation to find yourself in. Just to say something about vulnerability, it shouldn't be forced. Like, so I don't want you to go force yourself to to be out and open with people or something like that. Like, the answer is not in my mind doing what I do, how I do it, or or you know I would say what anybody else does. Like, you have to find your truth, and that requires time with yourself deep introspection, learning about yourself. It's not selfish to be introspective. It's not selfish to, 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 to sit for a minute in this feeling that you have, you know, and try to understand why you feel the way you feel, to understand the social situation and, and the circumstances that you occupy and what they mean, and to take your time as a student to learn everything that you can about it, that you feel like you wanna learn about it and to not feel obligated to correct anybody about their misconceptions, and to not feel obligated to do this in any kind of way that's elegant, where the words are, are perfectly said or phrased to, 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 you know, I mean, on some level, you know, you want to be a good citizen and you, you, you want you want to you want to be nice to people, but but it's not your responsibility not to hurt somebody's feelings because they've hurt yours. You know, it's, it's not your responsibility to protect their ears because you said, ouch, when they stepped on your toes. That's, 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 that's not your responsibility. Your responsibility right now is to learn, to be a student, to grow. And I say, take full advantage of that. And once you've done that, once you've taken full advantage of this opportunity for growth, your truth will, 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 will be very clear to you. And, and, and your truth will be something that you won't be able to compromise, you know? So, 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 so with, with, with yours, I don't know that you should seek vulnerability. Uh, I, I think you should seek wisdom and that, and, that, and that wisdom should be steeped in who you are and who you are, by the way, and who all of us are. And it's not, you know, so I'm saying this to, 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 to the black student. Let me say who you are is beautiful. And I want to say this to every international student, who you are is beautiful too. Um, black student, who you are is no less beautiful than who any of these folks are. International student, who you are is no less beautiful than who that black student is. Uh, it, it's got its own beauty and, 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 and embrace it. You don't, you don't come from a tradition of deficit. You come from a tr tradition of power and growth. You come from a tradition of, of making do uh, with, 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 with very little, not saying your family situation. That's what I'm saying at all. I'm talking about black people in this country. We, we've, been, we've been denigrated uh, in this country and yet still, You've got a Jody Polk in this world. You understand what I'm saying? So like, so like, so, 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 so like there, there's something to take some deep pride in and that pride is also okay. You don't have to apologize for the pride either. I, I, I want, I just want to just buy every student uh, an Afro pick. <laughs> <laughs> we have one last question. You've got to make it quick because we have to move over to meet with the students. It's, and this question says, it sounds like being in prison is treated to be equal to being a vi victim in this country. 
in this conversation. Being in prison is a result of the individual's wrongdoing, isn't it? There have been 2,800 exonerations since 1989, or since we've counted them. 95% of all cases in this country are, 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 are uh, are, are resolved through what's called a plea deal. This means that the attorney didn't have enough evidence to convict you of the crime that they accused you of, and they dangled 50, 60, 70 years uh, over your head, separated you from your children if you didn't sign on that dotted line. Now, having said that, that doesn't mean that people haven't committed crimes. Of course they have. Of course they have. Um, I think you should read my book. Uh, if, if, uh, if, you know, one of, one, of the, one of the questions is, one of the questions is, um, at what point does one pay a so-called debt to society? Where does this logic come from? And when does one pay it? And if you've been out of prison or jail for 30 years for any crime, is it right that you can't rent an apartment? And who does that serve? Is it good for you that I can't find a place to stay? Well, if you're afraid of me, if, the, if, it's, if it's a calculus of public safety and you're afraid of me, I now have nowhere to be. I'm gonna be in your neighborhood walking around waiting on you. You know, so, 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 so if it's a self-interest question, which I think is the wrong framework, but if it is, if it's a self-interested sort of frame, then perhaps out of self-interest, you would say, we build something that might help people uh, uh, thrive rather than suffer in this country because their suffering is related to the kinds of crimes they commit to begin with. Well, that's what the, that's what the research shows. Um, but there's also an ethical question how do you treat your fellow human being? This is the question. And what if everything you've done was held against you? How would you want to be treated? Would you think that's right? So the questions that we've raised today, and I'm glad this is the last question actually, the questions that we've raised today have been about things to look at the many millions of people who have been locked out of the labor market. 19 million people have a felony conviction in this country. One third of US adults have a criminal record. 38% of white men will be arrested before they turn 23 for something that's not involving traffic, meaning they committed a crime. So, 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 so with that, what kind of world do you want? That's the question that we're trying to raise. And what kind of world that should we build? I think the world that we've built is one based on vengeance, based on retribution. And I think what, what, what that's gotten us is the largest prison system in the history of the modern world. Now, Americans are no more criminal than Lithuanians, than Chinese people, than Japanese people, than Russians, than, any other, than, than, than folks from any other nation in the world. We're no more criminally inclined. That's silly. Why is our prison so big? Is this the world that you want? A permanent pariah class, is that what we want? And if it's not, then I think we can do something about it. So I wanna thank both of you um, for coming. We have a private conversation with students in a second. And so that we're on time with that. I just wanna end with this last comment. It wasn't a question from one of our panelists. It says, thank you for open, opening my eyes to the extent and depth of the challenges of incarcerated and post-incarcerated individuals face. Your experiences are so revelatory and inspiring. The term SOCA means value creation as in creating value from our challenges, which is what you are doing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And if you look to hear more conversations like this, please go to SOCA.edu, check out the Center for uh, Race, Ethnicity, and Human Rights. And we expect to continue our conversations and race and its connections um, throughout the academic year. Thank you. Good night. Good night.